about because today we begin a new series called This Is How We Do It. If you'd like to take notes, our ushers uh, have them uh, handy, so if you'll just raise your hand, they'll be happy to get a copy of the notes to you. Uh, and as we begin today, I do want to say welcome to those of you who have joined us online as well. We're glad that you are a part of this service, even maybe you couldn't be here physically on this holiday weekend, but we're glad for everyone that's joined us in the house as well. And uh, I thought in, before we spend three consecutive weeks talking about how we do church at CLC, it might be good to even ask ourselves, why, why does it matter? Why is this important in the first place? Um, you know, I think we understand that Jesus died to give birth to the church. So what did he see in it? What, what is so important about church that we should devote this time and attention? And, and I want to read a passage of Scripture today in Psalm number 73, if you have a Bible. If you don't have one with you, we'll get it on the screen for you. And I will tell you, this passage of Scripture has ministered to me more than once over the years because I think sometimes uh, we fall into the same trap that the man who wrote it, his name is Asaph. You know, all the Psalms were not written by David. This was written by a worship leader named Asaph. And he begins in verse 1 by saying, Truly God is good to Israel to those whose hearts are pure. But as for me, I almost lost my footing. My feet were slipping, and I was almost gone. For I envied the proud when I saw them prosper despite their wickedness. They seem to live such painless lives. Their bodies are so healthy and strong. They don't have troubles like other people. They're not plagued with problems like everyone else. They wear pride like a jeweled necklace and clothe themselves with cruelty. These fat cats have everything their hearts could ever wish for. Is there anybody in the room that's ever felt like that? Maybe you didn't use those exact words, but, but you thought, you know, this, this is crazy. Drop down to verse 12 where he continues. Look at these wicked people enjoying a life of ease while their riches multiply. Did I keep my heart pure for nothing? Did I keep myself innocent for no reason? I've been there. I've asked that question. And, and, and I think the reason that we sometimes ask that is because we have this belief, this assumption that if I go to church and, and live right, then surely life is going to go well for me. You know, that's a, that's a logical idea. But sometimes our experience challenges our belief. And it seems like even though we're doing what's right and we're trying to serve God, things are not going so well for us. And so I, I, I just, I'm going to take a minute to tell you maybe why you don't need church. And when we planned this message and got to this part, our pastor said, don't teach that very good, pastor. They, 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 some of them already have that idea, you know. But I will tell you, it's easier today than it's ever been not to need church. Because, because of modern technology, you know, it used to be when I was coming up as a kid, if you wanted to hear a, a word from God, you pretty well had to go to church. But now you can download on your cell phone, you can listen to Stephen Furtick or T.D. Jakes or your favorite brother Wonderful, and you can hear the latest word from God that they have to share. And if you like corporate worship, if you like singing and worship, you know, you can download Hillsong or Elevation or Bethel or, again, whoever your favorite worship team might be. Some of you might even want to download CLC, you know. Uh, you can worship there in your own home all by yourself. And so maybe it's easier not to need the church. I'll tell you another reason. This is an important reason why maybe you don't need church, and that's because church is messy. Look at your neighbor and say, he's telling the truth right now. Church is messy. I mean, how many of you know where two or three are gathered together in his name, sooner or later, there's going to be a mess? <laughs> you know what I'm talking about? It works like that. And, and by the way, if you're thinking, well, I'll just go to another church then, uh, it's messy at that church too. Yeah. Yeah. And, and I'll tell you another reason. It costs something to be part of the church. It costs you time. It costs you energy. It costs you resources. Asaph continued, verse 14, I want you to notice. He said, I get nothing but trouble all day long. Every morning brings me pain. If I had really spoken this way to others, I would have been a traitor to your people. So I tried to understand why the wicked prosper. But what a difficult task it is. 
Notice verse 17. You, you dare not read this chapter and stop at verse 16. Okay, you don't get the full story if you do. Verse 17, he says, Then I went into your sanctuary, O God, and I finally understood the destiny of the wicked. Yeah. Asaph's problem was the same one that we sometimes have. He, he, he lost his perspective. He was forgetful about some truths that, that we all have to be reminded of sometimes because he was only focused on the earthly perspective until he got to church and then he could see things the way they really are. And when you do that, I think you'll conclude what I have. I need church. I don't say that because I'm a paid pastor. I say that because my soul needs church. Now, a few months ago, we heard from six of our young men here at CLC who have a call of God in their lives. And it dawned on me, you know, we're, we're a church that believes in women in ministry as well. And we have a number of women in this congregation that the hand of God is on for ministry. And so today we're going to be hearing, in this service, we're going to hear from a couple of them. Now, uh, they've had probably more experience than the guys did, so you probably don't have to help them as much as you did the guys back in the, in the, summer, in the spring. But uh, I'm sure they'll appreciate an amen or a head nod. But two of our ladies are going to share with us why they need the church. Would you welcome Tracy Mason as she comes today? Good morning, CLC. I am so excited and deeply honored to be here today to share with you why I need church and to look out and see so many faces this morning. I see so many faces looking at me. And these faces are not only in the church, these faces are the church. Because we, God's people, are the church. I see Pastor Jerry. Hey, <laughs> who years ago at God at the Movies taught me that by taking 20 seconds of the most insane courage, I could change my life. And he did. Pastor Chris, who teaches me by her example and her real transparency. And actually, both Pastor Jerry and Pastor Chris teach me by their example and transparency because I was in need of a breakthrough and I needed to be taught and I needed to learn because I had spent so many years walking around wearing a mask, pretending like everything was okay, when on the inside I was burned out, I was broken. I was depressed, I was near a breakdown, and desperately in need of help. But I was too afraid to share my heart because I was scared of what people would think. But I learned that church is a safe place where I can be real and can I, I can be as open as I want to, as I choose to, with whomever I want to, whenever I want to be. I need church because it gives me life. And I look out and I also see people who pray for me. And seriously, hopefully, they're praying for me right now at this very second. <laughs> Not only do people pray for me, they pray with me. And I don't just mean the pastors and the altar team that comes up here. I mean anybody. There are so many people in church that I can stop at any time and say, hey, would you pray for me? And they do. And so many people have stopped me and say, Tracy, what can I pray for? That gives me so much life. I see, speak, speak, I see people who speak life to me. They encourage me. They worship with me. They lead me in worship. And it all, all of these things give me life to be able to worship and to be with people who believe in me. Church provides me with such genuine love, genuine love that is unconditional. I mean, in church, I don't have to pretend. People love me and accept me as I am, not for who they expect me to be. 
They listen to my experiences when I share my feelings. They cry with me when I share my pain. They support me when I want to move forward. They stand with, me, stand with me when I have to make bold, courageous decisions that are really difficult. And then the people in the church rejoice with me when I share about God's goodness and how he is answering prayers and how he is keeping promises in my life. Sometimes, sometimes the love that I receive from church is absolutely overwhelming. And it's like God himself is wrapping his arms around me and saying, I see you and I love you. About two and a half years ago, my husband had a stroke. And the love we received from the church at that time gave us so much hope and strength and encouragement. Stephanie Blackwell found out, somehow, I don't even know, but she found out and she sent a text to the, to the group prayer line. And all of a sudden I started getting texts and phone calls asking what people could do. One night while my husband was still in the hospital because he spent two weeks in the hospital and rehab, I came to dance rehearsal. And I was real, and I just told my dance sisters, look, I need y'all to pray for me, and I need you to pray for me now. And they did. But Rachel Jones prayed and prayed for me. She prayed for my husband. She covered us. She sent angels into the hospital, into the rehab center, and she also prophesied to me. Audrey Lay was the leader of the greeters at that time, and she called me and she asked me when my husband was coming home from the hospital. So when we got home from the hospital, Audrey showed up with a pot of hot homemade chicken tortilla soup and salad. <laughs> and then a couple of weeks later, she, show, she showed up because she had told me, I got you Thanksgiving. So she showed up at our door with a full Thanksgiving dinner. I'm talking about a whole turkey, dressing, greens, pound cake, sweet potato pie, everything we needed. Eric and Megan Condon came to our house one day after church. Megan made the most amazing Filipino dinner. And then Eric didn't come in. I'm like, what? He said, give me a shovel. It had just snowed, my driveway was covered, the cars were covered, Eric came and he shoveled the snow, cleared off the cars, and then he left the windshield wipers up on the car so just in case it snowed again, the windows wouldn't get covered. And then one time when it was really getting overwhelming and I was getting frustrated and people were just doing things, I was like, okay, I need somebody to pray with me. I need to hear a voice. So while my husband was sleeping, I got the phone and I went in my room and I closed the door and I called Joe Marie Cooper. <laughs> and I said, Joe Marie, I need you to pray. She said, hold on, let me get somewhere where I can be alone and quiet and close the door. And I mean, Joe Marie prayed and we cried and we cried out together. By the time she got through, I was like, I could go on forever. And I'm so thankful um, for those people who gave so much life during that time. People just heard what was going on. Some of them didn't even know my husband, but they just heard what was going on, and they reached out and they asked what we could do. We got phone calls, text cards, you name it. And it gave us so much strength during that time. That period of time was overwhelming at times. It was scary. For me, it got to be physically exhausting and even lonely. But the love that God showed to us through the church, gave us so much strength and helped us endure. And it showed so much love to my husband. They don't know him. But he was like, these people are showing up and helping me, and they don't even know me. And it gave us so much love and strength. The church is not just what people do. I need the church because you just never know what is going to happen in such an atmosphere of worship. And I need that. I need the strength that comes from worship and prayer. 
Sometimes I can come to church. Sometimes I have to make myself come to church. I might be tired, especially during the time when my husband is sick. But I know if I can get to church, I'm going to get what I need. And sometimes it's like God himself is pulling me up out of the bed and carrying me to church. But every time I get here, whether I feel like it when I get here or not, by the time I hit the parking lot, I'm rejoicing and I always leave with something that I need. You never know what is going to happen in the atmosphere of prayer and worship, and, and we just never know how God is going to respond. And there was one time a few years ago, I, I came into church so burdened and heavy, it was like a ton of bricks was on me, and I was just dragging myself in. And there was an atmosphere of worship and prayer, and Pastor Chris was speaking that Sunday. And she got up here... And before she started preaching, she said, you know, <laughs> I just sense that there are some people here today who need to be encouraged. She said, you don't know what one another is going through. I don't know what one another is going through. But she said, I want you to turn to your neighbor and tell them to be encouraged. I was sitting next to Heather, Mor Heather Moran at that time, and we turned to one another and we said, be encouraged. And I don't know what happened. It came from nowhere. It was like a dam inside me broke. And I began sobbing and crying. And I'm not talking about crying like that. I'm talking about the ugly, uh, uh, the ugly cry. And Heather Moran, she just reached over and she put her hand on mine. And I could hear her whispering as she prayed for me. I immediately felt lighter. The ton of bricks was gone. I felt encouraged because I needed that love. I needed that human touch. I needed the prayer I needed to be encouraged. And I didn't feel ashamed because I was up in here boohooing like crazy. I, was, I didn't feel judged. I wasn't even embarrassed. You know how I felt? I felt loved. I felt secure. And I felt strengthened. And I walked out of here with my head held high, determined, ready to win this race. It's no matter how I feel when I arrive, or no matter how tired I am, or no matter what the devil does to try to stop me or tell me I can skip, I always get what I need from church. There are so many stories that I could tell about why I need church. But this is what I really want you all to know. Church is not the place I go to, Church is the family I belong to. It's the unexpected friendships. It's the smiling faces that hug and greet me when I arrive and then smile and wave as I leave the parking lot. Church is my family of greeters and ushers who just a few weeks ago when I wasn't feeling well, they made me sit down they offered me water, and then they checked on me during service. Church is my sister friend, Wanda, who prayed and fasted with me and for me as I prepared for today. And not only Wanda, so many friends, so many texts, so much encouragement, so much love I received just um, as I prepared today. So I don't just want church, I need, like seriously need, <laughs> would not make it without church. I need church because I need people. And not just any people, I need people with God's heart and God's love who will come alongside me and serve God with me, letting me know we're all in this together. I have the most Loving family, my mom is right there. <laughs> loving, 
supportive family, and I have some of the most amazing friends that I am so thankful for, but I still need church. I deeply need church because God does not want me to try and handle the life on my own and all the challenges that life brings. I need church. I desperately need church because I need help and guidance as I try my very best to focus on God, follow him, and live this life as I go from point A to point B. I need church because it makes me feel good to know that my gifts are needed and appreciate it as I serve God and his people. I need church because I need to be an environment of prayer and worship with other people who need church. Author Philip Yancey said, I go to church as an expression of my need for God and need for God's family. I so totally, 100% agree. Church is not an obligation. Church is not a duty. Y'all, church is a gift from God. And so I say to God, thank you for church. And church, thank you for being the church. Beautiful. That's terrific. She, uh, she already preached a message today to all of us, but we've got one more. So would you welcome Sol McQuay as she comes today. Good morning. It is a real honor being able to just be here and share with you why church is so important to me. I grew up in a Christian family. My parents uh, were actually uh, pastors at the church that that uh, we were going to, not full-time pastors, but part-time pastors. So for us, going to church growing up was not an option. It was, you're going to church, <laughs> you know? Uh, so it, was, it, just, it didn't matter if my friends were going to Six Flags. Well, they're going to have fun. You're going to go to church, you know? Uh, but there's a birthday party. We're going to church. But there's this thing going on, at, you know, at, at the town square or wherever. Well, we're going to church. There's this family function. We're going to be late because we're going to church. So it didn't matter what the question was. The answer was, we're going to church. And growing up, I didn't really understand why it was so important to go into church. It, it, it didn't make sense when I really wanted to do something else that I couldn't because I had to go to church. But 17 years later, I can tell you today without a doubt that that discipline of going to church week in and week out has helped me refocus, being able to know that God is first in my life, that it doesn't matter what's going on, God is first. That it doesn't matter if the day is nice and it's sunny and we could be doing something else. In my life, God is first. And that's something that I just live in every day. And that's what I'm trying to pass on to my kids now. It's understanding that God is first. Everything else can come second. But we go into church first because that's, there is where you can build those relationships. Like Tracy was saying, it's where you can hear God's voice. And it's where God can actually use other people to speak into your life and bring some encouragement. And that is something that happened to me this past April. Um, we have three kids. And how many parents out there know that once you have kids, your prayer life increases like so much. I don't think that I have ever been so spiritual in my life until I started having kids. And my kids are wild. We had a, a kid falling down of a second story window, landing on his head on concrete. We had a little girl that grabbed one of my bobby pants and put it in the electrical socket and of course got electrocuted. I promise you, we're, we're good parents. But, uh, <laughs> but we, we, we were able to see God's faithfulness and God just miraculously healing these kids to the point that we go to the doctor and they had nothing. The doctors were completely shocked when we got there and we're like, well, he just fell down, down and, and he hit his head and they're looking at him and there's like, there's nothing but a tiny little scratch on his ear. And he just looks annoyed from being here. 
You know, so just, just take him home, he's fine. We've seen that. But over like a year and a half ago now, my son Jaden, the oldest, started kind of developing a motor tick. So he will just kind of start going like this and just cracking his neck. And at first it was a little annoying, so we were just like, Jaden, please stop doing that. It's just weird. And then we realized it's a compulsion. He cannot, he cannot stop it, he cannot control it, he just keeps going. And as every good parent will do, we consulted uh, Dr. Google. And Dr. Google said, it's normal. Most kids his age, especially boys, will have that at some point in their lives. And within a month or two, it will just clear up and he will be fine. So we're like, okay, so we just have to wait a couple of months. So we were waiting and waiting and we realized that this was not going away. This was not getting any better. So we started praying. We started praying and praying for him, and we were waiting, and we were praying, and we were waiting, and we were praying, and nothing happened. Two months, three months, four months, five months, seven months, and we were getting really worried about it. We started praying even harder. We started just anointing him with oil. We were starting just quoting every healing scripture that there's in the Bible, and we're just believing God for healing, but he is not getting any better. Actually, he was getting worse. He was starting developing different ticks on top of the whole cracking of the neck. He would just start moving his, his fingers. He would start kind of twitching his legs. He would start clearing his throat. And um, our pediatrician told us that we needed to take him to the neurologist. So we take him to the neurologist, and the neurologist looks at him, does all kinds of tests, and he says, he looks normal to me, but this has been happening for a year now. So we cannot say that it's a transitory tick because it's still here. So we're just gonna have to keep him under um, close, close observation. And if this doesn't go away, uh, we can then say that he has Tourette syndrome and uh, we might be able to give him medicine because there's nothing that will cure this syndrome. So we can just kind of control it a little bit. And when we learned that the medicine that they were kind of thinking about giving him was just basically sedatives. My heart just sunk. And I was just thinking, I don't want my son sedated. Especially not Jaden. Jaden is a good kid. If you tell me that you want to sedate Bennett, uh, we, can, we, can, we, can we can think about that. Because you might be able to convince me on that. Uh, but but Jaden, Jaden is the good one. He is the agreeable one. He's the one that sits quietly and, and, and has no, you know, like, no outburst of energy and stuff like that. He's, he's a good kid. And I was in a really bad place emotionally. I was really, really heavy. And it was the time of the heart-to-heart -heart retreat. And it was one of those moments that I went to the retreat because, you know, there's, there's the retreat and, and this is what you do. And you go and you do what you have to do. And I was just really not in a good place emotionally. And the very first night, we started with worship. And we were just in the presence of God. And, and I was praying, and I was worshiping. And all of a sudden, God just started downloading all of this to me. Uh, and, and he just started revealing to me that this wasn't a physical thing, per se, that it was an attack of the enemy on his body, trying to make him uh, just be um, sad, depressed, having low self-esteem issues and all of those things. And I froze, like we're in the middle of worship and I froze because I didn't know how to process the fact that the enemy wants to attack that badly at eight year old. To the point that I have a kid at home crying and saying, is this ever gonna go away? Am I ever gonna just not have to do this? Or celebrating because he hasn't cracked his neck in five minutes. It's, it, it was hard and um, and we just finished with worship that, 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 more, that, that night. And uh, Pastor Chris said, just go and hug somebody. And I just put a big smile on my face and started hugging people, you know, like, hey, mom said to hug people, so go hug people. And, and uh, my friend Kenya Lewis comes to me and she grabs my hands and she looks at me and she says, God made Jaden. And at that moment, I just knew God was speaking to her at the same time that he was speaking to me. And, and she just started just kind of repeating everything that God was just saying, you know, that it was an attack of the enemy, but that he was going to be okay. 
that God was going to be bringing people into our lives that can, that can build them up, that, that I, we were going to know that these relationships are God relationships specifically for him to, to be able to get out of this. And, 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 and that just started feeling a little bit better, but I was still having in the back of my head the whole, I don't want to have him on medication. And I'm never going to forget that she turns around and then grabs my hand again and looks at me in the eye and she says, and he doesn't need medication. She didn't know anything that what was going on with Jaden. I never had told her any, any of, the, of the details of, of his life before. But that just totally changed me because I knew in that moment that I need church because God can use somebody else to come to me and speak into my life. See, I've been praying for over a year and I was not even close to have any type of uh, answers about what is going on. But God used that moment and God used her to come and speak into my life to help me know that it is going to be okay, that, that he has everything under control. Because even though I know it, it's sometimes good to hear it too. And, and I know that I need church because I know that there are people in this place they can hear the voice of God and can speak into my life. They can bring encouragement. They can say, hey, you are not going through this alone. After, after the service uh, ended, I sat down with her and I started talking to her and I said, you have no idea what you just said because this is what has been happening to us. And she looked at me and she said, you know what? I'm going to pray this through with you guys. And we're going to pray until we see him healed. I need church because when I cannot go on my own, I know that I have somebody else standing with me saying, you know what? We're going to do this together. Oh, I'm sorry. I didn't expect to cry so much. <laughs> but I know that, that there's somebody there with me, praying with me, seeing things through. That when I feel so heavy, when I feel so alone, when I feel so overwhelmed, it's going to be somebody there. And I could be at my house, like Pastor Jerry said, and listening to Stephen Furtick or, or listening to any other preacher, which I do. But there's something that my phone cannot replicate. And that is the power of the Holy Spirit when we're together. It's that atmosphere of open heavens where God can just give you the answers to whatever it is that you need. And that is not something that I'm going to find on my own. That is not something that is going to happen when I am by myself in my house. Because there's certain things that require that atmosphere where God can just move, where God can speak, where God can send somebody to you, where God can reveal things to you. I need church. Church is important to me. And I believe that you need church as well. Wow. After hearing both of them, that's, that's the word that comes to me. Wow. Where would we be without the church? Because church is not something we do. Church is who we are. Aren't you thankful? Aren't you thankful to be a part of His church? 